Well, we are in a series this summer called Q&A, Your Questions, God's Answers. Our title today is, What Does the Bible Say About Gender Roles in Church Leadership? Um, this series of sermons is being delivered in, in response to questions that we solicited ahead of time from all of you in the congregation here at LifePoint. And thus far, we have addressed these four questions. First of all, how can I be confident that the Bible really is God's Word? Secondly, is the gospel good news for all of creation? Third, how can I be sure that I'm saved? Fourth, what are my responsibilities as a church member, or as we call it here at LifePoint, a church partner? Um, if you missed any of those messages, you can view them at mylpcole.com forward slash media or on our YouTube channel, LifePoint Church of Olympia. question I hope to answer this week was posed to me in words something like this. Why don't we see more women on the platform at LifePoint Church? Uh, teaching, preaching, praying, reading scripture, especially in view of the fact that Galatians 3.28 says, In Christ there is neither male nor female. So we're going to look at Galatians 3.28 in a moment. But I've paraphrased the question down to what does the Bible say about gender roles in the church? And I will say by way of an initial response that there are, in fact, women uh, on the platform here at LifePoint who lead in worship, that it's not unusual for some of them to read Scripture and to pray as part of that portion of our gatherings. Uh, But it's also true that you'll rarely see a woman preaching or teaching the entire congregation on a Sunday morning uh, in our church. And we'll be exploring reasons for that this morning. Before I get into that, I want to make a few statements by way of introduction to kind of frame my approach to this topic. First, the breadth and the depth with which the Bible speaks to these matters really prevents me from covering the entire topic in one sermon. Uh, this would probably be better addressed in a series of uh, sermons or teachings or classes. Uh, what I hope to do this morning is to simply provide a framework for understanding uh, the big issues theologically and then to outline ways that the apostles, particularly, particularly the apostle Paul, interpreted and applied these theological convictions for the roles of men and women in the New Testament church. Secondly, some of you may have difficulty with this message because what the Bible teaches on these matters really does run counter to contemporary cultural norms and and increasingly uh, counter to the practices of many contemporary churches, even entire denominations, Uh, And I hope that you'll bear with me and at least give consideration to the things that I have to share from God's Word. I'm I'm also aware that some pastors and some teachers have dealt with this topic in a manner and in a tone that, that comes across as demeaning to women and to women's involvement in ministry leadership. I don't happen to think that's ever appropriate. Uh, My goal is now, as always, to present God's Word in a manner that that respects and honors the value, the dignity of of both men and women. It's true that in the history of the Christian faith, uh, the church has at times suppressed, subjugated, and silenced women in ways that are entirely inconsistent with the honor and the dignity that God's Word ascribes to women and to their roles and in ways which the Lord Jesus would never approve. Third, On the other side of the coin, far too many pastors, uh, churches, entire denominations have abandoned the complexity of the biblical teaching on this topic altogether, either embracing an entirely secular philosophy um, and just kind of throwing caution to the wind, or or sidestepping the more countercultural scripture text in order to present a stance that's perhaps more palatable to the secular mind. Uh, We began this current series with the question about the Bible being God's authoritative word. In LifePoint Church's statement of beliefs is the statement regarding what we believe and teach about the Bible, which is that we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, 
and that human authors were moved by the Holy Spirit to write the very words of Scripture. We believe that the Bible is true and without error and is supremely authoritative for our lives. It's recorded in John eight thirty one to 32 that Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It will set you free. Though the world and even parts of the church may reject what God's word teaches on the roles of men and women, whether in marriage or in the family or in the church, uh, I believe that as we embrace these God-given roles, uh, we will discover in them, often to our surprise and astonishment, great freedom. And finally, I want to state clearly my conviction that for God's people, the proper starting point in the development of our theology and of our practice, that is the ways that we put things uh, into work and, and implement what we've been taught, must never be the value system of the dominant culture. Rather, the proper starting point has to be the sound interpretation of God's word which will transcend every culture and every age. And as the Holy Spirit makes us conscious of a conflict between the clear teaching of God's word and the values of the culture, uh, in the ways that we are thinking and acting, uh, our default reaction and response must always be to repent and to submit ourselves again and and anew to the authority and the will of God as he has revealed it to us in the pages of Scripture. Now, there are two schools of thought into which Christians tend to, to divide in their thinking about the biblical teaching on gender roles in the church. They are identified today as complementarianism and egalitarianism, Uh, And I offer these uh, as a a means, kind of a tool of helping you to frame uh, the matters we're talking about today in your minds. Complementarians and egalitarians. Let's begin with egalitarians. Uh, The term itself is derived from the French word that means equal. Uh, The egalitarian view is is that there are no roles or responsibilities that uniquely fall to the male or the female, no limitations on what functions men and women uh, can fulfill in marriage or in the family or in the church. And as regards the roles of men and women in, in the church, egalitarians believe that the redemption that was accomplished by Jesus Christ at the cross for us resulted in gender-specific roles um, Uh, being abolished, roles that were established in the Old Testament, such that there are no longer any distinctions between men and women in matters of leadership, whether in, again, marriage, family, church. Prominently then, egalitarians will argue for women to serve in the role of elders, to be ordained as pastors, uh, even senior pastors of churches. The scripture most frequently cited by egalitarians as the basis for their view is Galatians 3.28, where the apostle Paul wrote, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And we're going to return to that uh, a little bit later. The second group is complementarians. Complementarian is derived from the word complement with an E, not an I. A dictionary definition of complement is something that completes or makes perfect, either of two parts or things needed to complete the whole or counterparts. In Genesis 1, on that sixth and final day of God's work of creation, we read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now very quickly notice with me in verse 26 the stated purpose for which God created mankind, which is to bear and to reflect the image of God, the likeness of God, and together to exercise dominion or rule over the rest of the creation. In verse 27, we read a Hebrew parallelism that declares God's act of creation. What's a parallelism? Well, a parallelism is a a Hebrew literary device in which the first line will make a statement, the Each succeeding line will then restate the first in ways that that uh, add clarification or add essential information. Um, You see a lot of parallelisms, for example, in the Psalms, and uh, usually there's just two lines. Sometimes there's three. Sometimes there are many. Um, But notice this one. In the first line, God creates man, verse 27, in his own image. It's not only that God created man, but very importantly, that he created man in his own image. The second line repeats the first, but this time in the inverse. In comparison to the third line, the emphasis in the second seems to be on the image of God in mankind in unity. That is the whole of mankind. But the third line then speaks of differentiation within the image. Differentiation that is deeply essential to the image. So that the image of God in man requires both the male and the female and is incomplete without it. And then comes the blessing of verse 28, which notice is not to him in singularity, but to them in unity and in equality. Man and woman sharing equally in the image of God, equally in glory and in honor and in dignity, equally in the task of procreation, equally in the work of exercising dominion over creation. Genesis 2 then, the second chapter, presents another look at the creation in somewhat protracted form. Uh, sometimes I think it's helpful to think of comparison between one and two as that one is the, the macro view, two is the micro view, uh, one is the big picture, two are the details. But in chapter two, we witness the creation of the man from the dust of the ground. His work of tending the garden that God created, his receipt of a prohibition from eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and his assertion of dominion over the animals in the work of naming them. Observe with me, make note of the fact that all of that happens before the creation of the woman. Then in verse 18, we read the very first not good in all of creation. Remember in, in chapter 1 of Genesis that each day of the creation ends with God seeing that it was good. Comes the end of, cha- of the sixth day when man was created and he says it's very good. The first not good in all of creation is identified in verse 18 of chapter 2 as the creator says, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Precisely what God would make for the man to solve the problem of his aloneness is not yet revealed here in verse 18. But God lays down a powerful and very specific prescription. God would make a helper fit for him. The word complement in complementarian has rich substantiation in this prescription as well as in the process by which God created this new person. The Hebrew for a helper fit, azer kenegdo, means a help fully equal to the man who corresponds perfectly to him, but who nevertheless remains distinct from him. In verse 22, that helper fit for him is revealed when God causes the man to sleep deeply deeply 
God, as the anesthetist, puts man into a deep sleep, takes from his rib cage a rib, from that rib fashions a woman, and then like a father of the bride, God brings the woman to him, and he responds in verse 23 by saying, Whoa, man! Where the word comes from? <coughs> no. He said, This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then in verse 24, we see the first recitation of the formula that will be repeated later by the Lord Jesus and the Apostle Paul as well. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Having been one flesh, then having been differentiated, then being brought back together, they are one flesh. Complementarians would believe that, do believe that God created male and female different and distinct from one another, that God designed specific roles for men and women that differ but are complementary, for which we are uniquely suited in our maleness or in our fail, uh, fail, in our failness. Maleness is not failness. <laughs> Femaleness, um, and in which we will find freedom and we will find fulfillment. That, that men and women are created as complementary expressions of the, the very image of God to be counterparts in reflecting his image and his glory. Further, as as we'll see in New Testament perspective, complementarians believe that God intends that men provide a living portrayal of Christ's relationship to the church. Christ's relationship to the church in a way that women cannot. And he intends that women provide a living portrayal of the church's relationship to Christ that men cannot. In other words, complementarians believe that who we are as male and female is ultimately not about us. That ought to inform a a, a current cultural conversation. We don't get to dictate what manhood and womanhood are all about. God has uniquely designed us to point to who he is and to serve as living portraits of his son, Jesus Christ, and his bride, the church. Theologically, then, the dividing line, the point of departure between complementarians and egalitarians begins with a very specific question. And that question is, was male headship ordained by God at the creation as part of God's creational design? Or did male headship come into being as a mere consequence of the fall? As you might already have guessed, complementarians will say that male headship is part of God's creational design. And egalitarians will say that it is not, but that it came in subsequent to the fall as a consequence of sin and as a way of coping with it. So here at LifePoint, we hold to a complementarian view of the relationships between men and women in marriage, in the family, and in the church. That males and females are different, but that God has fearfully and wonderfully designed us to uniquely and fully complement each other. As regards male headship and female submission, we assert that these did not originate at the fall, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, rather we believe and we teach that the, that what the fall itself did was to corrupt and to distort male headship into oppression and exploitation of women and to corrupt and distort female submissiveness into manipulation and control of men resulting in conflict being the new norm within the marriage and the family and by extension uh, 
in relations between men and women in the church. Well, how do we know that? Turn with me now to uh, what I think are the pertinent passages uh, in both Old and New Testaments. And again, our, our, our goal this morning is to frame a biblical understanding of gender roles in church leadership specifically. But in order to get there, we've got to look also at God's design for marriage and the family. And we're going to move pretty quickly through uh, several scripture texts in our study this morning may raise more questions than it answers. In fact, I hope it does. But buckle up and put a helmet on and let's go. Get your pen out and be ready to take notes. I mentioned earlier that Galatians 3.28 is a theme verse for the egalitarians. And I, and I want to stop here and say, can you be a Christian? Can you be saved and be an egalitarian? <laughs> Absolutely. This has nothing to do with salvation. So... If you find yourself falling into the camp of the egalitarians, uh, you are a believer, and uh, we love you, and we embrace you. Um, But I I don't want to move forward without asking whether Galatians 3.28 actually informs us with regard to gender roles in marriage or the family or the church, which are the three realms that the New Testament in particular governs, if you will. What a woman does in the business world, in society at large, is, is for the most part not governed at all in the New Testament, or in the Old for that matter. But since context is essential to sound interpretation, let's look at verse 28 in its larger context, specifically verses 23 to 29. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Now, it's pretty obvious that Paul is writing here to the whole church. And he's saying that the children of God are all those who have come to God through faith in Jesus Christ and have been baptized into him. His conclusion at the close of verse 28 is that all who have received the adoption as children of God through faith in Christ are one in Christ Jesus. So the question is, is this passage about the abolishment of role distinctions Or is it, in fact, and instead, about unity or oneness in Christ? So to get at that pretty quickly, let me ask you this. Does the Jew become a Greek because he's in Christ? What's the answer? You're not sure, right? You think it's a trick question. Does the Greek become a Jew? Uh, Our recently concluded study through Acts, the Acts of the Apostles indicated otherwise, didn't it? Does the slave and and a large segment of uh, Greek and Roman society were slaves? Does the slave uh, cease to be a slave of necessity because he or she puts their faith in Christ? No. Uh, Does a free person cease to be free? No. Does, Does a man cease to be male? Or a woman cease to be female by virtue of her faith in Christ? And again, the answer is no. So the the conclusion must be that Paul is not saying here that distinctions of race, race or social status or gender are abolished in Christ, but that everyone who comes to God by faith gains entrance into a new community characterized by radical unity within diversity of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and gender, as we are included in Christ. You know, a, a, quick, a quick scan across this room tells me that there are mixed races here. 
We're all one in Christ. We, we experience the oneness. We are, in fact, made one by God in Jesus Christ. Next, before looking at some of the passages in which Paul speaks to gender roles in the church, let's turn to Ephesians 5, because I want to ask the question uh, of what God intends headship and submission to look like among redeemed people, especially husbands and wives. In Ephesians 5.18, the Apostle Paul gives the command that kind of controls the flow of, of the rest of chapter 5 and into chapter 6. The command is that believers in Jesus Christ are to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. That is, we're to be continually drawing on the Holy Spirit continual source of filling, of renewal, of power, and equipping to live lives that are pleasing to God. In verses 19 to 21, then, he lists four outcomes that the filling of the Holy Spirit will enable in the life of every Christian. Things you should look for in the life of someone who claims to be filled with the Spirit. First of all, speech that builds each other up in Christ. Secondly, hearts of worship. Third, continual thankfulness, that just constant attitude of gratitude and submission to one another, then, out of reverence for Christ. Don't miss that. The relationship of every Christian to every other Christian is to be characterized by submissiveness, that we are to honor each other, that we are to put others before ourselves. That ought to characterize life in the community of believers. Then in verses 22 to 33, Paul prescribes how that mutual submissiveness among believers is to be worked out in marriage. First, he says in verses 22 to 24, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. A Christian wife is to make it her goal to submit, not to every man in the church, but to one man, her own husband, in a manner that paints a picture for all to see of the church's submissiveness to Christ. Now, what do you think, ladies? Is this kind of an easy task? Some of you are nodding. Some of you are not sure. Some of you are saying, absolutely not. It's not. Why? Because your husband is a sinner. And oh, by the way, you are too. It's only possible by the redemption that's brought about by Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. He's declaring something new and radical. It's only possible by the redemption brought about by Jesus Christ and the ongoing supernatural filling of the Holy Spirit. In verses 25 to 30, he lays out for a husband what his submissive headship toward his wife should look like. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and blameless. In the same way, Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. See, here is biblical, male, masculine, spirit-filled headship. It's self-sacrificial. It gives up its life. Its purpose It's to elevate, honor, purify, and beautify one's wife. It loves, it nourishes, it cherishes. And it has as its model the headship of Jesus Christ over his church. So what do you think, men? Piece of cake, right? 
None of you are laughing. Wrong. Wrong. Why? Uh, Because your wife's a sinner. Yes, but also you're a sinner as well. There's no one else to marry, just sinners. And so this is only possible by the ongoing, radical, supernatural filling of the Holy Spirit in your life, who manifests the character of Christ in you and through you. And here Paul quotes those well-known words from Genesis 2, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery, this mystery of marriage, is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as he loves himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. See, the same apostle Paul then provides what I think is, you know, kind of the vital link between this and headship in the church when he writes to Timothy about the qualifications of an overseer. And at 1 Timothy 3, 5, in that list says, he must manage his own household well, And with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? There's a, there's a linkage between effectiveness in marriage and family and effectiveness in leadership in the church. This is not at all to say that a woman is to submit to an elder or any other leadership or any other leader in the church in the specific way that she is to submit to her husband. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. I know that there are some churches, and thankfully they're in a great distinct minority who believe that every woman in the church ought to submit to every man in the church, and that's just wrong. (laughs) I want to pause here and make note that a complementarian view of relationships of men and women in marriage and in the church must not be equated with patriarchalism. Now, these days when we hear the word patriarchy, we, we nearly always associate it with a misogynistic system in which Women are oppressed and squelched. And biblical complementarianism, biblical Christianity, stands against the oppression of women and is committed to their flourishing as men and women live and serve God together under the authority and the blessing of his word. Neither is complementarianism to be equated with mere stereotypical traditionalism. What we're talking about here is creational design that transcends and therefore supersedes the traditions of time and culture. A a woman named Mary Cassian, who actually was part of the group of leaders who first coined the term complementarian back in the 80s, wrote to women, if you hear someone tell you that complementarity means you have to get married, have dozens of babies, be a stay-at-home housewife, clean toilets, completely forego a career, chuck your brain, tolerate abuse, watch Leave It to Beaver reruns, bury your gifts, deny your personality, and bobblehead nod yes to everything men say. Don't believe her. That's a straw woman misrepresentation. It's not complementarianism. And all God's women said, I want to turn now to some of the scripture texts that that speak specifically to roles of males and females in church leadership, uh, each of them from the letters of the Apostle Paul. And again, time prevents me from offering a full exposition of these scriptures, but I want you to at least understand the thrust of what they say and something of the reasons for the Apostle Paul's directives, and then we'll move to some conclusions. Paul wrote this instruction to Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 14, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Well, that's a mouthful, isn't it? In context, 
Paul's instruction here has to do with the conduct, uh, the personal conduct of men and women in church, in a gathering like this one. In the preceding verses, verses 8 to 10, Paul calls both men and women in different ways to personal holiness, to prayer, to reconciliation of relationships, to a lifestyle of service. But then in verses 11 to 14, he gives this command that raises the eyebrows of nearly everyone in the 21st century church. So so what does he mean? The word quietly in verse 11 is hesukia. The word doesn't insist or even necessarily imply verbal silence, but rather an inner quietness, a calmness, a tranquility of spirit produced by the presence of the Spirit of God in her life. Paul's words here call to mind the words of Peter in 1 Peter 3, 4, where he calls wives to adorn themselves with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. Gentle, tranquil, peaceful spirit. Same word is used um, here in verse 12 of 1 Timothy 2. She is to remain quiet. The word submissiveness is hupatage. It means literally to place yourself willingly, knowingly, intentionally under an authority. It's actually a military term. In this case, Paul is saying that a woman is to learn with a quiet spirit in submission to God and to her husband. In verse 12, Paul is clearly forbidding something. We need to understand what exactly it is. The teaching seems to me problematic in light of 1 Corinthians 11.5, where Paul seems to permit a woman to both pray and prophesy. He says it very matter-of-factly in 1 Corinthians 11.5, that a woman is permitted to pray and prophesy in church. We noted in our our study of Acts that Philip the Evangelist had daughters who were practicing prophetesses who would have practiced that gift in church. We also read of a woman like Paul's close friend Priscilla uh, participating with her husband Aquila to give instruction in the faith to no less a spiritual leader than Apollos. So against that backdrop, is Paul now saying that there is never an occasion in which a woman can teach a man or a group that includes men? I, for one, personally don't think that can possibly be what he is saying. The verb tense of teach and and exercise authority, those, those words in verse 12, I think is informative. It is, not that you have to remember this, but in the Greek it's the present infinitive active tense. And what it refers to is action that is continuous and repeated. So a more literal translation might be, I do not permit a woman to go on teaching and exercising authority over men, or to perpetually do that, or to consistently do that. The implication being that by doing so, She's overtly usurping the role of an elder and superseding the authority of the elders of her church. Uh, This sense coincides with the New Testament teaching that the responsibility for, for the ongoing authoritative doctrinal instruction belongs to the male elders of the church. There are some who argue that Paul here is simply reverting to uh, patriarchal tradition, um, that his instruction is culture-bound, and, and therefore we can just dis- dismiss it as outdated. That Paul doesn't allow us that latitude in our interpretation. Notice that for substantiation, Paul does not appeal at all to current custom, nor does he appeal, for example, to rabbinical tradition, which he might uh, have done. 
Instead, his appeal goes all the way back to Genesis, long before any rabbinical teaching or rabbinical tradition had been given. First to the order of creation itself, and then to the order of the fall. Let's explore what he's saying. In verse 13, Paul refers to the prior formation of Adam as supporting his thesis. His formation prior to Eve's formation. Why? Well, in the Old Testament, the first son in a family inherited upon his father's death a double portion of his father's goods as his inheritance. In other words, his siblings got one one part each, he got two. He got a double portion of the inheritance, of the division of the inheritance. And he became the head of his father's house. He became its spiritual leader. And it seems to me that what Paul is appealing to here in the prior formation of Adam is an assertion that his status as the first formed carried with it the authority for leadership that would later be given to a firstborn son. The old age-old question, did Adam have a belly button? <laughs> no, he couldn't have been the firstborn. He, he was the first formed. Paul expressed these themes that apply to the authority of the firstborn in Colossians 1, 15 to 18, where he wrote of Jesus Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is, notice, before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And that word preeminence uh, has significance in relationship to the rights and the principle of the firstborn. Next, in verse 14, Paul offers a second argument for his thesis regarding male leadership, which is the order of the fall. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. And this sounds at first blush like a slam on Adam's wife Eve, doesn't it? And there have indeed been times in the history of the church when, when pastors and theologians have concluded that Paul was asserting that men are to be the spiritual leaders for this very reason, that women are more vulnerable to spiritual deception than men. How many of you believe that? Probably not very many. <laughs> At least two factors argue against that interpretation. One is that it was to Adam not to Eve, that God issued the prohibition. Remember, I asked you to kind of make note of that. It was to Adam, not to Eve, that God issued the prohibition. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Secondly, Paul wrote to the Romans, sin came into the world through one man. What was his name? You guys are pretty tentative today. Adam, thank you. Sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. It was not the woman who was held responsible for the entrance of sin into the world, but the one man, Adam. Why? Because Adam was in possession of the command. He had the responsibility for leading and protecting his wife spiritually. The record of the sin in the garden in Genesis 3, 6 validates Paul's claim that that the woman was deceived by the serpent, but that her husband, who was right there with her, was not deceived, but ate the fruit knowingly. There is never an assertion in Scripture that Adam was deceived. So Paul's assertion here is a statement in the inverse. Adam's failure to lead led to tragedy, 
Nevertheless, it is a demonstration that the responsibility and the authority to lead and to protect his wife belonged to him. Finally, and I'll conclude with this, in Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 3, 1 to 13, he lays out for Timothy a list of qualifications necessary for those who would fulfill the offices of elder and deacon in the church. At the time, Timothy was shepherding the church in Ephesus. And reading the list, I'm not going to take the time to read the whole thing, but at least two things stand out as you read that list. The first is that the roles of elder and deacon are limited to men. Where is that written? In verse 2, an elder is to be the husband of one wife. And in verse 12, the same is said of a deacon. Um, Secondly, that the overwhelming emphasis in these qualifications is on the character, the lifestyle, the reputation of these men. And in fact, the only functional ability, the only skill, the only capacity that appears on the list is that an elder must be able to teach, which I take to mean not that an elder has to be a gifted public speaker, but but rather that he must possess the ability to articulate sound doctrine, to refute false doctrine, and to provide correction to those who are in error. The Greek word translated elder in the New Testament is episkopos, which is also rendered overseer in some translations. That would be actually a literal translation. The word for pastor is poimen. And again, a literal translation of this word is shepherd. Interestingly, in the New Testament, the noun form is used in a very limited scope. It's used for men whose job is actually to tend real sheep. Uh, For example, those shepherds that were visited by an angel outside of Bethlehem the night that Jesus was born. Jude used the noun form to denote false teachers, false shepherds, he called them. Jesus used the noun form when he described himself as the good shepherd. Peter used it of Jesus as the chief shepherd. But the noun form is used only once to describe church leadership. In Ephesians 4.11, Paul wrote, and God gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be shepherds and teachers. This is actually the only place in the entire New Testament that the English noun pastor is in some versions translated, uh, tra- that the English noun pastor translates in some versions the Greek word poimen. Some translations, like the ESV, which we use here at LifePoint, uh, don't use the word pastor at all, opting for the literal word shepherd. So there's a, a verb form of the word, and it's never used in the New Testament, except in connection with the function of elders in local churches. For example, Paul wrote, 1 Peter 5, 1-2, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. In a related text in Acts 20, as Paul issued his farewell address to the elders of the church in Ephesus, you may remember this from our study in Acts, He said, pay careful attention to yourselves, again, speaking to elders, and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Well, what do we make of this? The apostles understood that the office of elder was limited to men, and that they understood the title of elder and pastor shepherd to be interchangeable. And in terms of function, identical. The office of elder and pastor are one and the same, and their function is to give spiritual oversight, instruction, protection, and care to the church. 
Well, let's move to some conclusions. What, what, what does a little wind sprint through the Bible tell us about how we should think about gender roles in the leadership of LifePoint Church? We believe, on the basis of the teaching of God's Word, that authority and responsibility for spiritual pastoral leadership in the church is vested in qualified, godly male elders. The role of the elders is to provide spiritual oversight of the church through teaching sound biblical doctrine, to protect the flock from false teachers and others who would do harm to the church family, to provide wise, godly biblical counsel to each and every member, And the function of pastors and elders, again, from a biblical perspective, are identical. Some elders are paid for their leadership in the church. At LifePoint, those elders are called pastors. Let me interject here that no one, that in no way should should anyone construe the reason for biblical teaching on male leadership in the church to be that men are superior to women, whether in intelligence, wisdom, spirituality, morality, or in any other way. I think it's obvious, should be obvious to any fair-minded person, that the women are often smarter, wiser, more savvy, more spiritually mature, make much better leaders than men. It's a little boy that said to his friend, my dad can lick your dad. Kid says, well, that's nothing, my mom can lick my dad. <laughs> See, the, the Bible never in any way declares men to be superior to women. Male leadership in the church is solely a function of creational design and apostolic prescription. It's that way because God said so. And because he said so, we obey. In his first letter to the church in Corinth, Paul added this postscript to a discussion of the roles of men and women in the church. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman, For as woman was made from man, and so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. So here's an important question. Would it be appropriate for a qualified, gifted woman to teach the entire church occasionally on a Sunday morning if she did so under the authority of the elders with their blessing? I happen to believe it would be. What is not permitted by Scripture is an ongoing ministry of teaching in which pastoral authority is being exercised over the congregation. That is the exclusive responsibility and accountability before God of the elders. For that reason, we we would not commission a woman to serve as an elder in LifePoint Church, nor would we ordain a woman to bear the title of pastor. However, I think it's essential that we ask whether the Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts to women to enable them to exercise a ministry that is pastoral in its scope and effect. I think it's obvious that many women do possess those gifts. The next question then is who ought to be the recipients of a woman's ministry of shepherding or teaching? And again, the scriptures are clear that that a woman should not have an ongoing ministry in which she regularly teaches or exercises authority over men. But what about a ministry of teaching and shepherding women or teens or children with the permission and the blessing of the elders? That, in my view, is entirely appropriate. A year or so ago, a family left our church and gave as part of their rationale for leaving that I had allowed a woman to stand on the platform on a Sunday morning and lead the congregation by reading Scripture. And they saw that as a violation of God's Word. It is categorically not a violation of God's Word. See, I would love to to be able to involve more women more men, for that matter, in the conduct of our worship gatherings, reading scripture, praying, leading worship, and more. How many other ways are there for women to serve in the church and through the church in the community and in the world? The answer is thousands. 
Sky's the limit, really. The, the reality is that if it weren't for faithful women, many aspects of the ministry of our church and every other church and parachurch ministry in town would fail. And I'm so thankful for the number of women who are serving well in so many areas that wonderfully contribute to the overall success of our ministries. But I want in closing to issue a challenge. As he introduced his instructions to Timothy on the qualifications of an overseer, Paul wrote, the saying is trustworthy if anyone aspires, aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. I believe that we are living in the last of the last days leading up to the rapture of the church. I believe that the Lord Jesus is right at the door. And one of the crying needs of the church at large and of Life Point Church specifically in these last days is for men to rise up, be responsive to the voice of the Spirit of God, and assume spiritual leadership in their marriages, in their families, and in our church. I wonder frequently, where are the men in this church who aspire to the office of elder or pastor or Bible teacher or life group leader or youth worker or Sunday school teacher or evangelist? And I could go on. Where are the men who aspire to roles of spiritual influence in the lives of the men and women and teens and children of our church? Where are the men who possess a faith that's so contagious that that they won't be satisfied until they're engaged in helping others to find and follow Jesus in their lives? Where are the men? Where are the men? And women, I want to challenge you to stir up the men in our church by expecting them to step up and exercise their God-given role to be the spiritual leaders of our church. And I want to encourage you to do that by stepping up yourselves to a deeper walk with God, a greater hunger for His Word, a deeper experience of His Spirit, and fuller service within this body of believers. Let's pray together. Lord, this teaching is in so many ways overwhelming because uh, I am reminded, I imagine each of us is reminded of our inadequacy in ourselves for any of this. And yet your word says that the Spirit has made us adequate as ministers of this new covenant And so we offer ourselves to you and ask, Lord, that you would use us. I pray, Lord, that you would, by your Spirit, stir up the men in this church to greater leadership. Move us out of apathy and indifference to love and action. And Lord, I pray that you would stir up the women in this church to be a spiritual challenge to us. by their godliness, by their character, by their spirits, by their service. And Lord, as we come now to your table and this ritual that we call communion or the Lord's Supper, we are reminded that the ground is level at the foot of the cross, that you invite men and women, boys and girls of every tongue and tribe, people and nation to salvation in Christ, to radical unity, 
to deep community and to a demonstration to the world of the image and likeness of God being restored in us by your Holy Spirit. May our marriages point to Christ and the church. May our church point to wholeness and renewal, transformation, compassion, love, grace, mercy toward those around us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.